Why did I become an actress? Probably because my friends told me that I did it very well in college. That's when I first was in a play. And I knew I liked it, but I, I really never thought I could make a living at it. And I also I thought it was sort of a silly thing to be. So even when I was in graduate school studying acting, I registered for the law boards, which is the test you take to go to law school, because I just thought it was kind of a silly way to spend your life as an actor. I slept through the law board's test, and <laughs> I realized that I was sort of, you know, I'd been in a play the night before, and I loved it. And I just thought, well, why not do what you love, even if you can't make a living? And at the time I began, when I graduated from uh, acting school, there were 16 theaters that were shut down on Broadway. It was the beginning, it was in the 70s, it was in the last recession. And it was not a very good time to be beginning and have student loans and everything to pay off. But everything kind of fell into place and I don't know why, but I think it's just good fortune. I think it is possible to put challenges in front of students that bring acting out of them. But if they don't have the talent in them and a, a sort of innate, an innate understanding of how to embody other people, I don't think you can teach it if they don't have that. Uh, I'm a conduit for that empathy. I never think I'm going to be wrong. It just, <laughs> I, I think that the, that's the thing of not of belief, you know, it's the, when, when I watch my children play, the little ones, it never occurs to them that they're not actually who they think they are when they're, my son would be this, you know, I don't know what it was, like, no, it, he was, he had a big iron vest and Skeletor in, I don't know what this was, like a, you know, a very scary kind of robot character. He didn't think he wasn't Skeletor. When he came at me and went, ah! He thought he was really scary. He didn't doubt himself. So my relationship to acting is like it always was, even when I was a kid. I think I, think I am who I say I am. It's a pretty hard thing to do. Because many, many young people, I think you will agree, in the beginning seem to have nothing at all. Yeah. And, and, and with work and lots of training, which is not done so much anymore, the training part, they develop when they sometimes don't seem to have a natural talent at all. I think some of those people become better performers because they really have to work harder. And for instance, the, the, the person born with a natural voice you know, where they say you're going into opera tomorrow, I, I, I think maybe get spoiled very young. Could you? Could because you it is basically work and learning, and there are no shortcuts, and I think all this you will agree with. But often you can't tell in the beginning if the person has it or not. I was certainly the least likely young woman to succeed. No, no, quite serious, that? yes, all because right. of my New England background, I was... Certainly no type of a that you would think would be an actress. Before I started studying voice, you couldn't have heard me down to those people in the first row. Plus, you know, a real Yankee accent, you know, I'd say pack a pack the car in Harvard Square. <laughs> you know, and the first time in dramatic class that I read this sentence, of course they all burst out laughing and I burst out crying with humiliation. So it's a very risky thing to take upon yourself to play God with talent. I was working uh, as a box office cashier in Hollywood on weekends and going to UCLA and I performed a scene for Manny Get Your Gun at a party one night in San Diego for a class mm -hmm. and a gentleman came up with his wife and he said, uh, what do you want to do You know, when you get out of school? And I said, I want to go to New York and become, you know, go into musical comedy. And he said, well, why don't you go now? And you know, in 75 cents an hour, there was no way. And he said, no, I'll give you the money and I thought oh <laughs> you know what is this and uh, he said no I'm serious you call me I'll be out of town in a week and uh, I'll give you the money to go to New York so I called him from school a week later drove down to San Diego 
and uh, he's um, a wealthy millionaire. And he said, um, well, what do you, you really want to go into show business? I said, yes, I'm very sincere about it. He said, all right. And he wrote out a check for a thousand dollars. I'd never seen that many zeros in my life. Mm -hmm. And he said, now there are three stipulations. A, obviously you must never reveal my name because everybody in the world would be, you know, asking yeah. for money. Yeah. It's a loan. You must pay it back in five years uh, with no interest, you know, but uh, I want you to pay it back to feel that you are responsible for this and you must go to New York as you promised. And if you do make it, if you are successful in your chosen field, you must promise to help others out in show business. The most uh, accurate description of me would be, I would say, survivor. My dearest friend, really, you know, who was a mentor to me, and uh, he had MS for a long time, and then finally it, um, it, it got to him, and, and pretty soon he was unable to really move, except he could, you know, he could think and talk. So I, I remember seeing him talking about sitting and having memories, and he said to me that I, I shouldn't feel worried about him because he's not depressed, even though he can't move. He has, he has his mind, he has his memories, and he has his imagination. And I thought, you know, that's a survivor. I remember doing Night of a Hundred Stars in New York, and they were like, everybody was there. They had everyone. I mean, you can't imagine. Elizabeth Taylor, Betty Davis, Orson Welles, James Cagney, people we all grew up with, George Burns. Uh, the people of these icons of the past and Lee Strasberg uh, uh, turned to me and he said you see I look around me I see all these people like Elizabeth Taylor and um, all these um, and he said and you know what I see I said what he says I see survivors survivors I thought and more and more as time goes on, I say, yes, that's very accurate. I started uh, in dramatic school and uh, played all the uh, classical roles. I got to play all the roles that I'd never be cast as. You know, Medea and Clytemnestra and uh, Catherine and Taming of the Shrew and all these. So when I got out of uh, dramatic school and I thought the world was my oyster, no one was hiring uh, anybody who played classical uh, theater and i thought well i'll kill them with my singing I had a couple <laughs> jobs uh singing in, in nightclubs so at any rate uh i was hired uh one summer uh, again because of the deep voice and they didn't have to spend the money to transpose the sopranos part oh, okay. I, <laughs> if you know what i mean i just took it an octave to lower mm -hmm. and i got into a production the first production in the united states a three penny opera i remember i came out and i Again, very sultry, and I said, I, the song, the lyrics were, I used to believe in the days I was pure. <laughs> and the audience fell apart laughing. You are, okay. And I thought, what? It? And, and then the next line was, and I was pure like you used to be. And they fell apart again. And I suddenly thought, this is great. And since then, it's been, uh, I've been employed. In other words, you're permitted to do things on stage that you'd never do in real life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way I look at it. Same I think here. a lot this of people uh, right. go into uh, acting for that reason. For that reason. Yeah. You're talking about how other people view um, the art. And they'll say stuff, you know, like, one day you're going to make it. One day, one day, mm -hmm. you know, one day. And you're like, well, wait a minute. I, I paid my bills. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm making you a know, living. I'm making a living. I love you, what I do. I love what I do. And, and I feel the same way about my work at that point in time as I do when my movie makes a hundred million dollars or, or a billion. Or a billion. Yeah. <laughs> 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 a hundred million is a failure these what it, days. What it, what it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah. it's, it's, it's the, I think there's a certain fulfillment of faith that doing this has because you, you don't have a steady job. You know, no matter no matter how yeah. well you're doing, you're mm -hmm. still trying to find mm -hmm. what is the next thing. Mm -hmm. And when this job is over, you're like, well, what's the next one? And if I know what it might be mm -hmm. six months from now, like what's going to keep me going? And so that that same faith that you had to have when people said you're going to be an actor like that you were talking about. Yeah. 
I think you you use that it builds on a day to day basis for every little part of what this is. And if you don't have that from the beginning, you don't necessarily have what it, you don't have what it takes to do all the intricate um, moments. Until I saw James Dean at 18, I knew that I was the best actor pound for pound anywhere in the world, young actor in my mind that I was convinced of that till I saw Dean work. He was doing things that was totally out of my league. I had no idea. I had done Shakespeare at the Old Globe Theater. My background was classical and, and I gave great line readings and uh, appeared to be very natural and very naturalistic, but it was all it was all preconceived. It was all like thought out things. So finally I'd had it on the Chicky run and he wouldn't talk to me. So I grabbed him and I threw him into a car and I threatened him and so on and to tell him that I was the best young actor, but he, he was better and I had to know what he was doing or else. He calmed me down and he said, well, you've got to start doing things and not showing them. And I said, well, I don't know, what does that mean? Do something and don't show it. And he said, well, if you're drinking a cup of coffee, you gotta just drink drink the coffee, not act drinking the coffee. You've oh. got to really drink the coffee. And he said, it'll be very difficult at first because you'll be very self-conscious about it. But you know, you just got to drink it. Or if you're smoking a cigarette, you got to smoke the cigarette, not act smoking the cigarette. Later, I did study with Strasburg. Uh, it's like moment to moment reality level, yeah. which is what he was talking about. It's just a sim simple moment to moment reality level. If somebody says hello to you, you say hello. You don't presuppose the fact that uh, in a minute the door is going, somebody's going to knock at the door. You go and open the door, you don't suppose that somebody's got a gun standing on the other side. Then you see the man with the gun. You've got to try to live in that moment mm -hmm. and not presuppose the next moment. But I think that that has to do with like uh, uh, sort of a Stella Adler thing who is like a Brando's teacher. Uh, the object uh, becomes, uh, you notice how Brando always is using an object of some kind. He's always like, uh, he always has an object or something around. And I think Dean was probably doing a sensory thing uh -huh. of like, you know, of uh, bringing himself back into the object. I'll tell you a funny story. I played once a streetcar with Marlon Brando without any rehearsal because uh, uh, he was already then totally undisciplined and had taken a uh, two weeks vacation and during which I played with Tony Quinn, and then he was supposed to come back from his vacation, we were going to rehearse, and then we were going to play. So he arrived five minutes after half hour was called. This, the producer said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I said, to, and I said to Marlon, you want to try five minutes and see what happens? He said, <laughs> he said I'm game, and I said, okay, and we, rehearsed about five minutes and I thought, oh, I think this will, might work. He had never seen me. I had never seen him. We really had totally, I had a totally different interpretation than Jessica and he had a totally different layout than, than, than Quinn. It worked like a charm. I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, it was rather uh, uh, unnerving. But, and why it worked was that we had both rehearsed and played a lot in that set with those objects. We never lost circumstances. I'm very attuned to my partner, no matter if I've played with him a long time or a little time, I will be tuned in. And it, it worked. Now that can only work if circumstances, relationship, place, every tiny object is familiar to me. That's why, I mean, it's so hard to make real. Sometimes you learn what not to do, in all honesty. A mistake not to make next time. But, um, uh, what shortcuts you can't take. But I, I find, yeah, um, I find that there is, there's no shortcut, <laughs> there, there, there's no excuse for, for familiarity with the text. I mean, that's an old lesson that I learned a long time ago, but I didn't really understand it before. Uh, there is, a, there's always a distance that you have to What does to that go. mean, familiarity with the text? Well, you have to know what it is that you're saying. You have to know that you, you know, of course, you have to trust, you have to make the alliance of the people who are going to be making the movie as well in order to help you shape. But you, you have to know deep down inside somehow the truth behind what the character is going through. Even though you will, ne maybe you may, may, may never get a chance in order to actually, to actually verbalize it. But you have to understand that you have to know that the risk that the character is running every step of the way. Without that, you have not. Yeah. I concentrate mostly on physical actions and emotional situations.
because I, I'm, I'm not very good if I'm not emotional. But if it's emotional, comedy and emotional, I would be good. And so I just think about what can I do, not imitating anyone else, but just what motor can I set off in me that will get me cooking. You should know that it's nothing but rejection. And maybe four or five percent get past that, survive it emotionally, because it's really rough. And then you, I mean, you can make a living with commercials, doing TV now and everything, but when you start out, it's just rejection after rejection. And unless you want it so badly that you'll continue on anyway, you're not going to make it. It's crazy. There's something nutty in you that's driving a driving force in me I think it was because something was missing in my own makeup my own psyche and and I felt when I was on stage because I, I only did stage work until Bonnie and Clyde um, I was freer than I was in real life Apparently, they're getting a little tired of the new stuff and they are appreciative of, of what they already know about and want to see again the public. We needed a show that had a beginning, a middle, and a happy ending. Something they could depend on, and I think it's, it's become more important to them now, and that's why they're tuning in so regularly. They see things that are, oh, they're trying to make entertainment out of newsreels. What we see in the news, which, which is not very um, happy these days, and they're they're building shows around them, and to me that's not entertainment. You watch the early Lo I Love Lucy. I know that they were well written, and we had a wonderful time doing them, and I think it shows. That is the essence of our comedy. Those early I Love Lucy gave me my education in mm -hmm. the whole thing. Success was never labeled success by anyone uh, close to me. It was just go to work and do a good job, get the show out, learn how to do it, and do it to the best that it's, uh, you know, the best that it can be done, and teach others how to do it, because it was, as I say, a, a new way of doing things. I didn't have time to think of, of uh, being a success, personally. If the show was doing well, that was good. Perfectionist, I, I decided is attention to detail, which I'm very proud of, and that's the way I learned my craft. That's one thing that I, second thing I think that I'm, proudest of it i've learned my craft i went from being an actor you know a working actor to a movie star like it felt like overnight although i had been acting for 10 15 years before working on the stage i had even already won a tony award in a lot of ways my background is theater i grew up in theater and i always thought that theater was going to be how i found my myself and my work and my art connected to the great material, the great plays. Hollywood was something that I was lucky to find because I got into a very well-known movie. It sort of catapults you, you know. I was uh, not that ready for it. It was a period of adjustment. And I remember Lee Strasberg at that time looking at me at one point, wondering what was going on because I had a kind of an awkward, uh, I wasn't in the best of shape. I didn't fit the part of the celebrity who everybody, you know, notices and sees, that's an adjustment, maybe more so back then than it is now. I think now it comes more readily to people. As a matter of fact, a lot of young people want to be famous. It's part of the, uh, you know, part of their motivation. But back then with me, it was a real surprise. It was a real period of adjustment. It was Lee Strasberg who said to me, darling, you simply have to adjust. And I heard it, you know, because it's so simple and yet it's accurate. You, you know, you, you, you do have to, I have to adjust to this interview. I have to sit here and talk to you, something I don't do often in, in, and uh, adjust to it. So I like that. Uta Hagen, the famous acting teacher said, the mark of any great art, whether it be theater, whether it be film, is that when you walk into the theater, you have a human experience. Emotion, collectively, they move people. The two things I look for is ability and bravery. The reason why I fell in love with acting is because I fell in love with Arthur Miller, that was my first, and then August Wilson. Because Arthur Miller said, the reason why I write 
is because I want people to feel less alone. When you are creating art, you have to be a warrior. You have to live with fear. You probably have to lead with pain. You're going to have the imposter syndrome. I don't care what anyone says. The imposter syndrome does not go away. Just like the little scars on the violinists and the viola players at Juilliard, you know, they did not go away. You knew that they were violinists and they played the viola based on the big callous scars they had on their necks that did not go away. Creating any sense of art is rejection, imposter syndrome, fear, the fear that it's not gonna work, the fear that, oh, maybe they're right. I look for bravery all the time. I'm one of those people, I don't wanna to go to my grave saying that I wasn't brave enough. And then all of a sudden you have to create a film where the beauty of the film is in the heart of it. So I need, I need bravery because truth is bravery. And a lot of times we don't get truth on that screen. But when you really go for it, that is a sweet spark. Feels like church. Yeah. Feels like healing. Yeah. Feels like you're sh you've been shifted.